We could all use a little more humor in our lives, especially at work. You know, it feels like work can be pretty serious stuff and that we have to behave seriously. But our guests today laugh at that idea, literally because they have the research to back it up. Welcome to Work Better, a Steelcase podcast where we think about work and ways to make it better. I'm your host, Chris Congdon, and I'm with our producer, Rebecca Charbowski. Chris, I might be one of those people who takes life a little too seriously. No. <laughs> I get that a lot. So when I saw the TED Talk with Naomi Bagdonis and Jennifer Aker about humor at work, it really did open my eyes. Well, our conversation today did have me laughing a lot, but it's also serious business. Naomi and Jennifer wrote a book called Humor Seriously, why humor's a secret weapon in business and in life. And they actually teach a class about humor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Oh, I wish I'd had that course in college. Uh, I think most of us could have used it. (laughs) So in addition to being an author and an educator, Naomi's an experienced designer. She coaches executives and celebrities on everything from Saturday Night Live to corporate meetings. Jennifer speaks on the application of behavioral science to help companies and leaders impact well-being, and she's published in leading scientific journals and co-authored even more books, including The Dragonfly Effect. And maybe more important than that, they have a really cool quiz on their (laughs) website, and you can identify your own humor style, which we all have. And I think they guessed yours, right, Chris? Uh, Yes, they did right away. Very cool. So we're going to link to that in our show notes. Everyone should give it a try. And if you like this episode with Jennifer and Naomi, pass it on to a friend or a colleague who needs a laugh. Yes. Naomi and Jennifer, thank you for joining us on Work Better today. Hello. Thanks for having us. We're so happy to be here. I am happy that you are here too, because I could use a little more humor, I think, in my life. And I'm excited to talk about that. But before we get into that, I really want to know your backstory a little bit, because you're both teaching at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was working on my MBA a million years ago, like there was not a lot of laughter that I remember. There were (laughs) other emotions, perhaps, a lot of fear and (laughs) Um, other kinds of experiences. But I'm just curious, like, how you got started in, I'm going to say, the funny business. Excuse (laughs) the pun. That was like a bad dad joke, but... You're starting off strong. (laughs) All right. Jennifer, why don't you start? How did you get started on this path? Oh, gosh. Naomi and I have been working together for 10 years, but um, the 10 years or more prior to that, I was uniquely unfunny. I really? did not have a sense of humor. I was voted the least funny person in my family. I was <laughs> after the dog. Doing, after the dog. It yeah. was so, it was so, <laughs> the dog is actually at the top of the list, but I'm decidedly at the bottom rung. And I was fine with that. You know, as a scientist, you're trained to, to like yeah. not necessarily prioritize humor. And so, um, but I, I found myself in a place where I was really burned out um, doing very, meaningful things, but burned out. Mm -hmm. And um, when I asked Naomi to actually guest lecture in my class, which was the power of story class, I noticed how she taught the class for an hour and a half. She had the students laughing wildly. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, um, eight weeks later, when they did ratings, they not only loved her content, they retained her content. And it put me on this path of understanding wait, when does humor help um, in our own lives and also in business? And that started our collaboration. Cool. Naomi, what about you? And I came from the opposite angle of Jennifer, where um, humor was always super, super important to me and to my family. Um, You know, we had a long tradition of generations of, of my family members that really, really embraced humor from, you know, hosting skit nights in the basement during the depression to uh, having really serious illnesses in the family and having humor be part of the way that we cope. And so mm-hmm. growing up, I was was raised with this family that he, or with this value that um, humor is a really important thing to foster in your life. And so I was, you know, I was doing improv comedy, but I realized that in going into a professional job um, out of college, as many of us do, I had the experience mm-hmm. that now we is we have research-backed 
Um, you know, we have data that shows that this is a really common experience for people. But I essentially started leading a double life where at work, I was serious and professional, extremely poised and completely humorless. And then outside of work, I was having so much fun and um, I had, you know, such uh, personality as we all do. And, um, and so I realized I had been sort of leading this double life. And the result of it was that I had no good friends at work. I didn't feel known. I was burning out. I was feeling really exhausted. And it just wasn't feeling sustainable to me. And so when I went to, to Stanford to do my MBA myself, my mission was really to combine these two things and to say, okay, how do I completely be myself while also doing the work that I'm really passionate about? And then the, the beautiful timing of it was that Jennifer and I connected at that time. Um, and I was really deeply inspired by the work that she was doing. And we just like, we just kind of mind melded after this guest lecture. We had what was supposed to be a 30 minute debriefing call. And we talked for three hours about how, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is super important. It's something that, that feels like it's missing, especially in the business world. How might we collaborate on this together? Well, that is such a great backstory. And I, I want to ask you uh, in a minute, Jennifer, like, first of all, I didn't know families voted on, you know, who was the least or most funny, but I, I think you and I have something in common. Like I probably would have been definitely beneath the dog on the list for sure. But but I want to ask you actually a scientific question first, because I am a bit of a nerd. And in your work, you both talk about things that happen in our brains when we laugh. And I would love to hear a little bit more about what happens kind of neurologically when we're engaged in, in humor. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we laugh together, our brains release a set of hormones. And so um, even that early strong pun is enough to do this. So when we laugh together, um, we release uh, endorphins, giving us a feeling like a runner's high. Our cortisol is lowered. So and that gives us a sense of calmness, kind of like doing a short meditation. Uh, and then not just that, but we also release dopamine, which is the hormone released during certain types of physical touch. So as far as our brains are concerned, laughing together is similar to exercising, meditating, and having sex all at the same time. Very efficient. Yeah, it's logistically much simpler as well. <laughs> HR does not get nervous. Um, and so... But think about that, right? You've got this, um, the endorphins of the elevation, but you also have the reduced cortisol, this calming thing. Um, and so it has neurologically significant benefit for us. So in your work, you've talked about four pillars behind this. And um, can you just tell me, like, what are those pillars and how do we kind of break this down? I don't know. Naomi, do you want to start on this one? Yeah, sure. So um, so there's four areas where this research really falls. Um, what's wild is we first defined these pillars about 10 years ago, and now there's research into longevity, into all these different areas that are super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, you know, power and influence is one. So our colleagues at, uh, at Harvard and Wharton, Allison Wood Brooks, Maurice Schweitzer, um, and a few others that have done really awesome work in this area have found that if you are able to use humor effectively, and by the way, humor effectively just means that uh, someone laughs and it's not offensive. It's really, ah, it's, it's a pretty okay. low bar. Um, that people view you as higher in status, as more confident and more competent. Okay. Um, there's a ton of research around the impact of humor in negotiations, on motivation, People view you as more influential. They're more engaged. So this sort of power and influence category is one. Second is bonds. And that is that humor is a really effective way to shorten the distance between two people. Mm -hmm. um, we know that when strangers walk into a room together and laugh before engaging in a conversation, they end up connecting in ways that are more intimate and authentic. Um, and this, of course, is super important, especially as people are working remotely. Uh, the third is creativity. So we know that humor 
loosens our brains essentially. So it helps us overcome functional fixedness. As Jennifer mentioned, it lowers our cortisol. And so when we walk into a room, even if we are anticipating laughing in that room, our cortisol goes down and we are able to, to be more creative. Um, and so it's, it's a super powerful tool for organizations that want to create psychological safety and creativity. And then lastly, resilience. We know that teams that are able to laugh, especially in the face of hardship, bounce back much more effectively from setbacks. And we're actually currently writing a case with the U.S. Navy SEALs around mm. how important humor is in, um, in recruiting and setting the culture for the U.S. Navy SEALs because of this, because it's super, super important when it comes to resilience and being able to bounce back from setbacks. Yeah, I would imagine that that would help with coping skills a lot. So one of the things I just wonder about when we think about there's great benefits to humor, but there are probably other people who, like me, are going, but what do I do if I'm I'm not funny? So I just always assumed that about myself. I just, because there are other people who always seem to be the ones who were, you know, getting the attention, ha- telling the great joke, having everybody laugh. And um, in fact, I was actually at a party earlier in the year and talking to this woman I hadn't met before. And during the conversation, she says to the table, she's about me, like, you're a stitch. She's just a stitch. And I thought, me? Like, who are you talking about? Um, so then in like preparing for the interview, I saw that you have a quiz about yeah. what that, that there are different types of humor. And I so <laughs> I took it because I was feeling a sense of like, you know, I, am I going to be at the bottom of whatever the scale is? But <laughs> fortunately, you didn't have a ranking. But I just wondered <laughs> if you, you could talk about what are those different uh, humor personality types. Wait, do you want Naomi and I to guess? Oh, that would be more fun. Go ahead and guess. Okay. So we will guess. Um, I'll share two of the styles, and then um, Naomi can chime in on the other two styles, and then we'll ask you a surprise question, and we'll guess. Okay. <laughs> okay, the first two styles. So number one, uh, Naomi and I have done research for these last 10 years on hundreds of thousands of people across the, the world, and these four styles are really robust across um, these cultural contexts. Okay. The first style is stand-up, and they are loud and boisterous. They are often what we think of when we think of a funny person. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more extroverted. They're, they'd be great at roasts. Um, they have a mm-hmm. battery of jokes um, uh, at their whim, and they're uh, at ease in front of others. The second style is sweetheart, and they are earnest, honest, understated. They would not necessarily view themselves as funny or want to, but if you look at their humor, they use it to often uplift others. It's mm-hmm. um, it's often PG-13. A lot of puns are in there, um, <laughs> but they keep things really light. All right. Next, we have the sniper. So snipers are dry, witty, sarcastic. They're masters of the unexpected dig. They'll give that one liner. Will they, They'll be silent in conversation for 90% of it. And then they'll give a one liner that just crushes. Um, they don't need to be the center of attention. So oftentimes snipers feel like if just one or two people get my joke, then I know who my people are. Yeah. Um, they also say that their humor is an acquired taste, one that not everyone acquires. So that's the sniper. And then lastly, we have the magnets. Magnets are um, charismatic, effusive. They are um, more expressive in their humor, both both physically and also in terms of their intonation. Uh, They don't mind being the center of attention. And like the sweethearts, they also use humor that tends to be more uplifting, positive. Um, Also, tertiary research shows that this person is most likely to buy a round of drinks at the bar. Uh, So good person to... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to follow into a um, into a social setting, so there's the four styles, and okay. uh, let's see here. I have a Jennifer. Do you want to guess first? Do you want me to guess first? Um, okay, oh, well, let's guess at the exact same time. Okay, ready? Okay. One, one, two, two, three. Sweetheart, sweetheart. Well, magnet. You're pretty good at this. I'm half and half. Apparently, sweetheart I'm between, and sniper. Sniper. Uh, no, no, sweetheart. You can't and, be I'm a sweetheart and a magnet. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, I, first of all, I'm something. I mean, I just felt good about that. <laughs> I was like, I was like on the chart somewhere. But uh, that just really surprised me because 
I don't think of sweetheart as being a term that I would be described as, but maybe that's because, I don't know, when I think about things that are funny, I do like silly puns and silly things that'll just make people smile, I guess. But so we we all, all have a humor style, right? Absolutely. Even people who feel like they're not funny. Absolutely. And, um, and part of why this is so powerful to understand, one is it, it's really empowering to understand that everyone does have a humor style and we all can tap into or activate it in different ways. And it also is really helpful because especially when you think about the risks of humor, a lot of people say that they're held back from using humor because of those risks. Mm -hmm. And your risk is really um, defined by your humor style. So you, Chris, because you're a sweetheart magnet, we know that sweetheart magnets are super um, focused on uplifting other people. But what that means is that they sometimes over-index on self-deprecation. They can take themselves down to a degree that unless they're in the hot, a high status position at work, it can actually come across as, um, as taking away power from themselves. Hmm. On the other side, the snipers and stand-ups they use teasing style humor to build intimacy. So this is the style that says, if I'm making fun of you, it's because I really like you. And we mm -hmm. all know this style, but if mm -hmm. you're using that style of humor with someone who's a sweetheart and a magnet, or you don't have the relationship quite yet, then that humor style can backfire. It can feel off-putting um, or it can hurt feelings. So it's a, it's a really powerful um, tool to both bring out your own style to have more empathy for other people and appreciate their styles. And then also, of course, to, to mitigate some risk. Yeah. So what advice do you have for, you know, people who say, yeah, I think it would be good if we all laughed a little bit more and didn't take ourselves so seriously. Like what advice do you have for people at work about how to bring humor into the workplace in a way that's going to work for everybody? The first thing to know is this is not about being funny. And that sounds um, easy to internalize, but it's actually really hard because we often equate being funny with humor, mm -hmm. but they're actually really different. And, you know, there's very different types of humor that, that help you um, understand how humor and funny is different. It's also um, a couple of other insights that we, we share with our students. Number one, um, this is more about finding truth. And then, um, and then being able to share that truth, which is often quite funny, with a sense of levity. Um, we talk about um, being on the precipice of a smile. So it's like you're walking around and you're noticing truths and observations in the day to day. And often they're quite funny. And so if you take that mindset of walking through life on the precipice of a smile, uh, expecting to be delighted rather than disappointed, mm -hmm. you will start to observe these truths that you can note to yourself or share with others with a little bit of levity. And if we have time, you know, we can share a couple of tactics there, too. But the second um, insight that we share with our students is, again, this is not about being funny. This And so never ask yourself before you say something, will this make me sound funny? You always ask, how will this make others feel? And so you're training your brain to be able to read the room and know what is needed in the moment. So much about being competent is about knowing um, what the room needs, what is the goal of the meeting, how are people feeling and what is, what is best served in that moment to move that group ahead. And so mm -hmm. if you ask yourself, if you get out of this mindset of I'm trying to be funny or someone needs to be funny and instead really anchor on what is needed in the moment, that will actually um, move you toward, you know, kind of creating this culture of levity uh, with your teams, your family members, uh, and even just with your own self. And so as leaders in an organization, a lot of our listeners are leaders at all kinds of different levels, but you know, we think a lot about trying to create culture and the kind of culture where people, you know, come to work and they're feeling good about their experience. Are there things that leaders can do to help kind of set the conditions for humor or should leaders just kind of get out of the way and, you know, not, not wreck it? Oh, that's such a, I love that question because, um, the answer is both. <laughs> oh, okay. They should both, there are things that leaders should do. And also it's super important to get out of the way. Yeah. Um, so 
I think number one is setting the tone from the top. And rather than thinking about being funny, as Jennifer said, this is really about being human. So mm-hmm. if we show up as humans, as um, you know, leaders who talk about their extracurriculars, who talk about what they're passionate about, who mention, hey, I went, um, I went on a run with my, or I went, I took my first backpacking trip with my 11 year old and it was a complete, you know, dumpster fire disaster and tell the story of that. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly humanizing and it makes other people feel a lot safer. Um, so there's that, uh, a lot of people though, if they're a leader and they don't feel like they're, uh, they're necessarily funny themselves or can tap into that levity, um, oftentimes you can elevate other people for this, for whom this comes more naturally. So, um, so you can find culture carriers at the organization mm-hmm. who are really good at, uh, making that energy feel really natural, making, um, other people feel more comfortable, bringing them into the all hands meetings and co-facilitating with them is another thing that leaders can do. But I want to get at your second point, Chris, which is getting out of the way. And I think about, um, an early story from Pixar. So this was Ed Catmull, um, former president of Pixar, told us this story where he um, he noticed that in the early days of Pixar, there was a lot of sort of rabble rousing, rule breaking, people were mm-hmm. having fun all the time. But then as people sort of grew up in the organization and a lot of the people who were the rabble rousers, um, you know, had young kids, uh, weren't staying out late or or right. making trouble anymore. The culture sort of shifted. Yep. And he had this realization, you know, it's really important that especially the more junior people in the organization feel like they can have fun and break rules. And so what Ed did was he asked around the more junior people and he said, hey, who's someone who has a lot of fun, knows how to break rules? And he sort of whispered and he found a couple people, a couple, one woman in particular who, who you know, was like, really, really great at having fun and breaking rules. And mm-hmm. he said, listen, I want you to know that, um, that that's a really important part of this culture too. And you're not going to get in trouble for, um, for doing that type of thing. And then a couple months later, they were like shooting water bottle cannons in the parking mm-hmm. lot and breaking windows and things like that. And so I think it's a bit of both. It's both setting the tone from the top, um, that you can bring your full self to work here not that you can be funny, but you can bring your full sense of work, uh, your full self to work. And then second, really recognizing that part of your job as a leader is just to not kill the fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so I work with a woman who, um, she loves costumes. Uh, she loves, she loves Halloween, but like, it doesn't have to be Halloween. Like on her birthday, like she came in in the full regalia, the birthday crown and like she totally owned it and I love that about her and I guess it would seem like as a leader like let that happen you know as opposed to you know kind of frowning because she wasn't appropriately dressed um you know just encourage that kind of stuff when it happens right yeah totally. yeah totally. just a little bit of physical humor um one of the things I was wondering about is speaking of physical is like physical presence. Um, we think about this a lot because, you know, it feels like something really good happens when you're all like together in a space, like that seems to create conditions where, I don't know, laughter just seems to happen more. But what do you think in terms of your work? Is there, is it a challenge when people are, uh, located all over the world that we're on video, we're doing hybrid work, that kind of thing. Does that make it harder to have humor at work? Well, yes and no. Number one, um, you know, physical proximity and just being around each other um, certainly helps you better, you know, read the room, understand the energy in the room, understand um, what someone's actually experiencing, feeling, doing, and what the team's goals are. So yes, but that said, um, one thing that COVID has taught us is that the different modalities of interrelating with others certainly presents its own opportunities to create humor and levity. One of our co-lecturers or a, our co-lecturer, Connor Demon Yeoman, he was the CEO of Merit America, um, along with his co-CEO, Rebecca. He shares a story right at the beginning of COVID 
and he shares with our students how he was running his first ever all hands meeting. And um, he was very nervous. He was very worried. Everyone was uh, sort of um, scared and nervous. He starts his meeting off and then he passes the deck um, and the screen to Rebecca. And he, but he for pretends to forget to leave the screen share on. So everyone's mm -hmm. watching him as he goes to Google, starts typing in something and everyone's petrified for him. <laughs> um, and he types in things inspirational CEOs say during hard times. And everyone <laughs> loses it and he comes back to the screen and he's like, I just want you to know you can trust me. Um, and so, you know, and he plays ah. with it. And everyone's laughing and they came up to him afterwards and said to both of them that it really was the first time that they had laughed in so long and it felt like therapy. And mm -hmm. so that, that, that just kind of illuminates, we know that leaders with a sense of humor are seen as about 28% more admired and motivated. Their teams mm -hmm. are twice as creative. They're about 15% more engaged and the bar is so low. You can do something as funny as a sort of a dad pun or mom pun or something like what Connor did. And it has extraordinary impact and it can be done even if you're not together in the same time. Well, thank you. I, I will start Googling ridiculous things and <laughs> letting everybody see those at work. Uh, one of the reasons I was really excited to talk with both of you is this season on Work Better, uh, we're thinking a lot about joy and is joy at work even possible? We think it is. And so I wanted to wrap up by asking each of you just to tell a quick story about a moment that you've experienced a little bit of joy in your work. So Naomi, why don't you start? I'll put you on the, on the spot. I, I think the secret is to find a way to work with people who you love or just relentlessly be yourself with the people that you work with. And eventually enough exposure, you're probably going to end up loving them. But um, for me, Working with Jennifer over the last 10 years has been basically a, um, yeah, a series of, of really, really having fun and laughing together. And so I have lots of examples, but one that comes to mind is whenever we are teaching and, um, you know, we'll be on a Zoom with 200 executives from all over the world and one of her kids will accidentally walk by in the background and most people would just be like, oh, okay, you know, my kid is passing in the background, no big deal. Jennifer, without fail, will stop everything and go, wait, wait, Coop, Coop, come here, come say hi. And then like stop everything. <laughs> and the whole Zoom is laughing because now Cooper has to like come over and say hi. And she's like, oh, you know, this is what happened. Cooper, she'll ask him a question that the students have to answer you know, and he's sort of wanting to get away from the screen, but also is the best sport ever and the most intelligent, like, kid. Anyways, um, so yeah, anytime, anytime we're on Zoom with Jennifer and anything goes wrong in the background, whether it's a kid walking by, a dog, dog barking, she just embraces it and it always cracks me up. That's awesome. Jennifer, what about you? Have you ever had a moment of joy at work? Oh, absolutely. Um, I bring my dog to work all the time, who's, by the way, <laughs> Naomi's god dog. And anything he does, it brings about joy, not just to me, but everyone around him. He remains number one humor hero in the family. <laughs> and I am still last. <laughs> well, I think both of you have brought a little bit of joy to my work today. So I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and telling us a little bit more. And um, I just really want to thank you for bringing some of your ideas and your work and your senses of humor to work better today. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Is your workplace ready for the new ways people are working today? Steelcase has all of its latest solutions to help you refresh your office in one place. Steelcase.com slash WB new. Explore new ways to collaborate anywhere, anytime, and see better ways to focus and block out distractions. That's at Steelcase.com slash WB new. Thanks for being here with us today. This season has been full of fantastic conversations. It really has. And if any of our listeners have missed past episodes, they stand the test of time. It's worth going back and taking a listen. Mm -hmm. 
We talked about why we need more women on teams. Very important. <laughs> how we can get more done by doing less. Also important. <laughs> and we talked about how we can think about our environments differently to actually bring us more joy at work. Lots of ideas for finding, creating, and designing joyful moments. Absolutely. And if you enjoyed this conversation or any of the others throughout the season, we'd really appreciate it if you could help spread the joy and share it with a friend or a colleague, rate it or write a review. And of course, visit us at steelcase.com slash research and sign up for weekly updates on workplace research insights and design ideas delivered right to your inbox. Thanks again for being here. And we hope your day at work tomorrow is just a little bit better. Many thanks to everyone who helps make Work Better Podcast possible. Creative Art Direction is by Aaron Ellison. Editing and Sound Mixing by Soundpost Studios. Technical Support by Mark Caswell and Jose Jimenez. And Digital Publishing by Aureli Ariano and Jordan Marks.